So what the heck is this thing? Well, it's another of my new acquisitions, and it's actually one of the coolest computers I've ever owned. Unfortunately, it's also become a bit of a project. So while I work on some other scripted videos, I thought I'd just take a minute here to give you a little tour of this machine, show you what it's doing, and maybe even ask for a little bit of your advice. So let's take a look. So not to draw out the suspense here, this is an IBM P70 luggable computer. These things are super cool. Unfortunately, this one has turned into a little bit of a project. I'm not going to get to show you everything that I would like to today. In fact, I'm not even going to get to show you fully running any programs, but that's part of the reason why I wanted to show it off today. I'm going to take you through a tour of the machine itself show you what it should do and how it should work and what I think is wrong with it. And then I might actually ask you guys for a little bit of advice at the end. So stay tuned for that, but uh, let's just open this thing up. So first, what is a luggable computer? Well, it's a form factor we don't really have anymore. It's not a laptop. It may look a little bit like an early laptop, but it's not. It's actually a full-size desktop computer in a portable case meant to be carried around like a suitcase with a built-in screen and a full-size keyboard. Um, you have a new machine here, my VM. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. This is a full-function, no-compromise, portable desktop machine, and it's based on our Model 70. It's a 386, 20 megahertz system, and it's got expansion slots. It comes standard with four megabytes of main storage, and it has uh, disk drive options of uh, 60 or 120 megabytes. And it's an extremely powerful machine. IBM was not the only company that made these, but I've wanted one of these for a long time because of what I think is its best feature, and that is the gas plasma display. It's got an orange plasma display, same technology as was used in televisions for quite a while, but just a single color, orange. And it's an amazing display. You're looking at a tiny dot of neon argon gas. IBM has been working with a technology using thousands of these dots of light. The result, an ultra-thin computer display screen. Unfortunately, I'm not going to get to show you much of that today, and I'll tell you why as we go along, but it is just a great display. As you can see here, full-size keyboard, Basically, same layout as the Model M from uh, the PC, AT, XT, and onwards, uh, and PS2, obviously. This is actually a portable PS2. I don't know if I mentioned that before. Uh, it says here, IBM Personal System 2 Model P70, <laughs> and something else that I can't read from here. But yes, it is a portable PS2, and that is part of the problem that I'm having with it is some of the proprietary hardware that's in these. But anyway, so we've got the full-size keyboard. It does detach. It does stand on its own. It is fully detachable if you want to take that out and you can do whatever you want with the keyboard. It's pretty cool. It's not the best keyboard. It does have standard micro switches. Uh, I'm not, I can't remember what these actually are. They're not buckling springs like in uh, IBM's home computer keyboards of the time, like the Model M. It does it, but they still feel pretty good. They're still clicky. They still have a tactility to them. The keyboard itself is, you know, plastic. It's made to be lightweight, uh, to be a little less heavy to carry around with this thing, which weighs probably about 30 pounds total. So, yeah, let me just put this back here. Other things on the front of the unit here. We've got the built-in floppy drive, which is uh, an endless source of consternation for a lot of people with these. We've got the screen, which flips out, and that's another problem I'm having, is one of the hinges is broken. But, uh, so it doesn't actually quite go in straight, and the left side just kind of flops around a little bit, which is annoying, but hopefully I can fix that at some point. Down here we've just got the power button, which I will be using later to show you this thing in operation as, as well as I can get it. And... Around the back, of course, we have the power receptacle. We have a large power supply fan. Well, large by standards of the day. 
And over here, we've got a parallel serial port. This is a proprietary external floppy port. PS2 mouse port. Obviously, it is a PS2 system, so one of the systems that pioneered that port. And this whole door actually opens up, and you can see behind that door, um, up here is just a standard VGA connector. So you can, if you are sick of the orange screen, you can hook up a full color VGA monitor to this. Now back here, you might not be able to see from this angle. Let me try and swing this around. There are two microchannel ports, uh, slots. Two microchannel slots for IBM's proprietary PS2 bus architecture. And one of them is taken by a modem, which I can't really do anything with at this point. But let's actually crack open the back of the case here so I can show you the motherboard and everything that's inside the computer. So it's just three big captive screws to get off the back of the case. And then it should just pop open we actually got all the screws off. Let me just make sure here. And there it is. And here's the inside of the computer. Um, it probably looks a little different than a lot of computers you've seen, but there's a lot of recognizable stuff in here as well. It is basically a desktop PS2 motherboard and just go through some of the components here. This is obviously the power supply. This is all the power supply down here. There is no battery because again, it's not a laptop. Uh, this here is the modem that I was talking about. Um, here you see four RAM DIMMs. These are just 72 pin SO DIMMs, two megabytes each. So I've got a total of eight in there. Um, and that is the maximum that the board will take. You can get a expansion card that will accept another eight. So you can have 16 total. I don't have that, but it is out there if I ever wanted to get one. On the motherboard, which is under everything here, actually this here, before I get to that, is basically the graphics card up here, this whole thing. And uh, yeah, I, I don't think there's a different one that you can get. I think this is it. It's basically a VGA card, uh, early VGA card, but it'll do CGA and EGA as well if you have that kind of monitor. Down here on the board, under the modem here is a 386DX20. It's a 20 megahertz chip. These were also available in 16 megahertz. This is the 20 megahertz. As happened with my 5150, I kind of lucked out a little bit with this machine and got one that was basically maxed out, uh, at least as far as what's available on the board. And I even got the 387 math coprocessor with it. So that's pretty cool. Over here, this is the weirdly proprietary PS2 hard drive, 170 megs. It's not SCSI, it's not IDE, it's not MFM, it's uh, whatever standard IBM was using at the time, which I understand was actually more robust than IDE and probably should have caught on but didn't. And most likely that's due to some sort of licensing fee, but I don't really know the story. But anyway, that's pretty much all the major components in here. It's all the same stuff you'd expect to see on any other board, uh, just arranged a little differently, maybe. So anyway, let's pack this back up and I'll fire it up for you and show you what it's doing right now. Okay, so I'm about to fire it up here and I'm just gonna shut up and let you hear the startup as much as possible through my microphone. You saw a little bit of the orange screen there. This is the memory test that it's doing right now. That's totally normal, but it's gonna throw up some error messages in a second and I'll talk a little bit about those when it does. Okay, so error 201 and 164. We've got 7808 KB OK in the memory test. 
Those error messages, the first one is saying memory test failed. The second one is saying memory size is not set correctly. I know exactly why it's doing both of those. And uh, when I first bought this computer, it had a couple of different errors on there that I thought were pretty benign and I could easily get past. They were, I, I think, error uh, 161 and 163, both of which just relate to a dead CMOS battery. So I got it, fired it up, hoped I would luck out and get this totally working computer that the seller just didn't know how to get past the error. And lo and behold, I did. I pressed F1 when I saw that error, got straight into the hard drive, saw everything that was on this machine. It's got Windows 3.1. It's got OS 2 warp in a dual boot. It's got uh, a whole bunch of other popular software from the time, early versions of Microsoft Word and other things like that. And it was amazing. And having verified that it worked, I shut it down and kind of stupidly decided to change the CMOS battery. Well, when you do that, it resets the BIOS. So originally this number up here was something like 8080K. And now it's 7808 the system's expecting to see 8080 or whatever. Where is that missing RAM? What happened to it? Well, this is the memory hole that people used to talk about between 640K and one megabyte in IBM PCs. It's there, it just needs to be allocated to something. And to do that, you need to get into the CMOS settings. Again, there's no BIOS, you can't just you know, hold down F1 or delete or whatever and get into the BIOS and change the settings. You need a reference disk. So the machine didn't come with one. I went ahead and made one. In fact, it's in here right now. Whoops. This is the reference disk for this computer. And it should have booted from it, but it didn't. One of the very common problems with these computers is that the floppy drives die. There are apparently various reasons for that. One of them is that, you know, they're vertical, so dirt gets in there very easily. There's no dust shield or anything there. Sort of shielded if you keep it locked up, but maybe the previous owner didn't. I don't know. So in any case, it's not reading anything, and it's not booting anything. And without, one of the, without being able to use one of the reference disks, you cannot change the settings, which means you cannot boot into the hard drive, even though everything else on this machine works everything but the floppy drive. The floppy drive being dead means the machine is dead. <laughs> this is one of IBM's stupid design decisions with the PS2, and it's driving me a little bit crazy. Now, there are options. There are things that I can do. First, I'm just going to try to clean the heads. I've got a head cleaning disc on the way. If that doesn't work, which it probably won't, then I'm going to probably need to, well, I'll probably try to repair the drive first. I can take it out, look at it, Sometimes the caps on these go bad. You can replace those. Sometimes that works. It's not a standard floppy drive, so you can't just replace it with any floppy drive if the cap repair doesn't work. You, you can either find another one of these, which is difficult and expensive, or you can adapt the cable to work with a standard floppy drive, and then you've got to do something with the eject button because it's not going to line up properly. So... None of these are really good options, but I'm going to have to try to tackle them one by one, and I'm kind of in the midst of planning for all that right now. And then the other thing is that hinge. Um, it's a plastic hinge. I've heard that some people say, you know, if you have good measurement calipers, you can measure it, you can get it 3D printed. I don't have any experience with that, so... You know, if anybody out there has one of these machines, has dealt with any of these issues, and managed to fix them, managed to replace a hinge, managed to fix a floppy drive. Let me know. Let me know what you did and how you did it. And if anyone has one of these machines and wants to sell it, especially for cheap, you know, even if it's broken, um, you know, maybe I can just salvage one of the, the hinges or the, hard, or the floppy drive or whatever and just keep a parts machine. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I would definitely be open to just buying a parts machine for this. I really want to get it working. I really want to do a proper video showing the, the amazing orange screen. You know, the previous owner 
had Windows 3.1, they've got a background of a castle, medieval castle, and just lit up in pure orange. It's beautiful. But anyway, that's about all I can show you for now. Um, I'll keep you updated on whatever progress I make with this, and if I do do any actual repairs, I'll shoot some repair videos. Uh, hopefully they'll work. But that's about it for now. I do have some scripted videos coming up, so look forward to those, and I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.